Are you ready to open the word this morning? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. You know, I love sermon series. I actually do. I really love, like, the planning and the organization. James hates them. Anyone who knows James would know why. Like, you know, don't put him in a box. Tell him what to do when he wants to run the other way. So a sermon series really is confining for him, and he's so excited that we have next weekend he gets to preach on whatever he wants to preach on. Yeah, it's going to be a good Sunday. And I'd like to point out I'm not going to be here to, like, to curve anything. So it's going to be an adventure. Come, come next week. If you're not coming to the women's retreat, it'll be an adventure. Um, and I'll come back to lots of emails, I'm sure. Uh, it's going to be good. But yeah, I love sermon series. But I also like there's a word that I actually got to share it with a women's um, a retreat evening thing when I went over to Kelowna a few, about a month ago and I got to go speak with some women and speak to them and I got to share a bit of this. It's been something that's been heavy on my heart. Uh, God's really been just working through it with me and so I'm excited this morning to actually have a moment to get to share with you guys some of what God has been speaking to me uh, in. It kind of started from reading this book. There's this book called um, Don't Let the Enemy Take a Seat at Your Table. Is that actually what it's called? It's something like that by Louis Giglio. If you type in that, you'll find it. Um, and he talks a bit about what I'm going to talk about this morning, not all of it, just a bit. And it made me really start digging into one of the Psalms that I think we all as believers, if you've been a believer for a long time, if you're new here, uh, welcome. It is a blessing and sometimes it's a blessing to see scripture through new eyes. Because this morning we're talking about a Psalm that I think those who've been Christians for a long time have read, a lot of us have memorized it, but I'm not sure we understand the depth of it. Going into Psalms 23 this morning, it is written by David. Let's just explain a bit about David's life, okay? David had been through a whole lot through his lifetime. David started out as a shepherd boy. We know that. We know that there's this fierce warrior in here, even though warrior in him, even though he was a shepherd. Why? Because he's literally killing bears with his bare hands. You know, we hear about that. And then we know the story, majority of people, even if you haven't been in the church, you've heard about David and Goliath. Right? Goliath is like taunting the Israelites and saying, like, where is your God? I am the giant that's taking over. Who do you think you are? And everyone's terrified of him, and they keep on sending people out, and they keep on getting killed. And David comes in, this little shepherd kid, and he's like bringing food to his brothers, and he's like, why isn't anyone defending God? Why isn't anyone going out there and actually fighting this giant? And, and they're all like, because, like, look at him. Like, look at all of this. And he says, no, I'm going. And then there's this beautiful, like, side story that I actually love that Saul and everyone tries to put his army or his armor on him and tell him how to go fight Goliath. And I love the confidence in David who says, no, I know who I am, and I'll fight the enemy the way that God's told me to fight the enemy. Amen? I think that's a beautiful picture of us as believers that we don't need to be someone else in order to have be victorious in what God's asked us to be victorious in. Amen? We get to just be who God's made us. And then David goes on, right? And David is just this faithful man. So through this, he gets into Saul's army and he becomes like Saul's right-hand guy and he's serving Saul as the king at the time. And then something shifts. Like Saul's like, great, I love you, David. You're like serving me and you're making me look good and this is awesome. And then all of a sudden, we we hear this psalm that is is proclaimed, not the one we're going to talk about this morning. We hear this psalm that's proclaimed and all of the people start singing as they come back from battle. And this is what they start singing. They start singing songs. Saul, you know, Saul is great and wonderful as a king. He's killed his thousands. Anyone know the story? And then what do they say? They say, but David, David has killed his what? David has killed his tens of thousands. And all of a sudden something happens in Saul. And Saul says, wow, you're not making me look great anymore. You're making yourself look great. And I'm not sure I like this. So then what does Saul do? Well, Saul then goes and Saul decides that now David is his enemy because he wanted to be noticed. He didn't want David to be noticed. So then Saul goes out and Saul actually tries to kill David and now David goes and he's hiding. It was amazing being in Israel and and seeing the landscape because, you know, we're here and we don't really understand the landscape that sometimes scripture's written in. And so we see this landscape and it's amazing how many caves are in the rocks. Like, they're just rolling hills, and there's just caves everywhere. Like, here you think, well, David's hiding in a cave. Well, we all know where the caves are. You know, you go out hiking, and you, like, know where, oh, I mean, at least James knows where every cave in the Kootenays is. Anyone who's been with James out in the bush, you would know that James knows where every cave is, and he's been inside it. Um, I don't know how he has not been eaten by a bear. Like, let's be honest. 
Like, let's be honest. If you know James' birth story, you know that God saved him right from the beginning, but he has continued to save him. <laughs> like, throughout, throughout our lives. Like, I'm just like, you know what, God? Like, I'm glad you have a plan for him because otherwise I'm pretty sure I would not have him anymore. Um, anyway, so David's hiding in the caves. And there's just hundreds of them. So it's really hard to know, you know, where David would be. And then we see that David actually had an opportunity to kill Saul. And I'm just highlighting all these stories. You can go back. You can read them. There's some really cool stories about David's life in Scripture. So David has this opportunity to kill Saul. Saul comes into, and David's in a cave that Saul comes into, and and he, he actually, like, just slits a little bit off of his clothing just to show that he was that close. And everyone's like, why didn't you kill him? Like, he's literally out to take your life. You have every right to have vengeance. Why didn't you just kill him? And you know what, David? David has this beautiful heart of realizing he said no because he is my king. He is the authority that God has put over me, and God will remove him when God wants to remove him, and until then, I will serve him. What a beautiful heart David has. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to get into it. David was a mess, too. But this beautiful heart posture before the Lord that just was so humble, I just think is beautiful. And so then, you know, David goes on and Saul dies. David becomes king. And you think it's all great and wonderful. Well, then David gets a little too big for his britches and David decides he can have whatever he wants. And then, you know, he's, he's looking down, he sees Bathsheba and he, he, who's this woman who's beautiful. And then, you know, the story goes, if you haven't heard it, I'll give you a nutshell. Uh, he, he sends Bathsheba's husband to the front lines to kill him basically so that he could take over his wife. Well, first he took her over and got her pregnant and then like thought, oh, I got to fix this. I'm going to send her husband out to be killed. This man who was like so after God's own heart and so humble makes this huge mistake. But then David has this heart posture before the Lord that still says and goes and says, you know what, I have screwed up. I am sorry I've screwed up. He has this ability to to have humility before the Lord. I think that's why God continues to call David a man after his own heart through all of his mistakes, through all of his things, is because David had this ability to be humble and say, I am willing to say when I screw up. So then David continues, and we know David's king, and he's king for a while, and when we pick up Psalm 23, we don't know exactly when it was written, but best case, uh, or best estimate that people assume is it's written during the season where King David had been king for a long time. He's near the end of his reign, and his son Absalom, had actually decided that he wanted the throne, and so he goes out and he's actually trying to make a run at the throne. So he's conspiring against his dad, and he's trying to get him killed and rally all the troops to to be able to take over the throne. So David went on the run again, and there's this battle for the throne between his son and David. And that's actually the best case that that we assume this Psalms was written during. Why do I say all that? Because to understand what David's life was like and where David was at when he wrote this psalm, I think actually gives it more depth. Because I think it's a psalm, and I think there's some things in there that we gloss over. It's a psalm that I think that we read to comfort us, and it should comfort us. But I don't think that we understand some of the gravity that the Lord was speaking in it. So on that, we're going to go through it. We're actually just going to go through it verse by verse and just look at what the Lord is saying through it. So this is David, and he is writing this psalm in this place of being betrayed, of of running and hiding, of facing giants, of reigning, of screwing up, and God redeeming him, of now his son is like going after him, all of this pain, all of this life experience, and this is what he writes. He says, the Lord, so Psalm 23, verse 1, I'm reading out of the ESV because I like the wording better than the CBS. Anyways, just so you know because normally I don't. First one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God declares, he says that, God, you are my shepherd, and by default, that means I am a sheep. I talked about it a bit when we were going through the Holy Spirit series on uh, pastoring, and the word pastoring actually means shepherd, like shepherding. 
I talked a bit about what a shepherd does, but a shepherd's three main, main reasons or main goals is what? Uh, protection, correction, and direction. It's what a shepherd was there for. It was to protect the sheep. Why? Because sheep were a little dumb. Amen. Right? Like, they're really cute, and they're fluffy. They give, their, their, their wool gives me a rash all the time. So, I mean, I have to love them from afar. But uh, they're, this is like these cute, cuddly things. But if we know them, like, they're, they're kind of dumb. If you talk to a shepherd and we spend some time with sheep, like, they don't know how to protect themselves. Like, they will literally run, like, headfirst into danger. They often don't even know how to find their own food. Like, you have to, like, put food right in front of them, water right in front of them for them actually to notice what they're supposed to do with it. They're kind of dumb. And I actually like this heart posture that David says before the Lord. He says, you are my shepherd, and by default, I'm a sheep, which means I know I'm kind of an idiot sometimes. You know, this piece of just says, like, I mean, I could say it nicer and say, you know, we're kind of like kids who just don't have enough knowledge. And yes, like, that's really what he's saying. But in, really, it's like, I can't take care of myself. I don't actually have enough to do it. He also is putting himself in a posture before the Lord saying, and I'm going to give you the ability to bring correction. Like you can bring correction to my life because I know that from my position of being a sheep, I'm going to screw up and make mistakes and not take care of myself. And then he's also saying, and God, I'm going to let you direct me. I'm not going to go by where I think I need to be. I'm actually going to let you tell me where I should be. Now, let me stop there. We make this statement sometimes in churches, and especially if you're new, you're like, what does it mean for God to direct me? Like, that seems a little weird, and it is. But here, we don't have to make it more complicated than it is. It's that if you have decisions in front of you, you pray about them, you don't get something clear, then you make whatever decision you want to make, and God will close a door, and don't try and kick it down. <laughs> really? That's as simple as it goes. If God doesn't want you to go a certain direction and you prayed about it and then you start going that direction and he closes the door, chances are he's giving you an answer. Don't kick it down. Now, I'm not talking about it being hard. I'm talking about it being closed. Let's move on to verse 2. So we got this position of he's saying, God, you are my shepherd and I am the sheep. He says, you make me lie down in green pastures, and he lead, or he makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. There's this beautiful piece of saying, like, yes, God, like, you are leading me beside still waters. Yes, God, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, and we talk about these as there's this beauty in it, and there is beauty in it. But the reason I love this version is because very close to the accurate words that were used there, and it actually says, he makes me lay down. He says, I'm taking you where I want you to be restored, and I want you to have rest, and I'm, sometimes I'm going to force you to do it. See, God realizes that sometimes in our human nature, we feel the need to accomplish things on our own, don't we? Anyone else with me, or is it just me? That there's a drive in you to say, I want to make sure that people know I'm doing a good job, that I'm all in. You know, to the point, if I'm truly honest, like, you know, sometimes when you're done your work early in a day, and then you sit in your office for the next hour, because you're like, I don't have anything to do, but if I leave, then someone's going to think I'm not working hard enough. Which is kind of crazy, because half the time, that means I'm going home for two hours and going to a different meeting. But you're right, these things, we do. We have a drive in us that says, I, I need to produce something. It's about me. And what, what it's saying here is he's saying, no, God, I recognize that sometimes my drive isn't from you. It's actually so that my name will be seen and not yours. And he says, sometimes he says, I'm going to make you lay down. And I'm going to put water in front of you and say, you know what, you need to drink. You need to rest. You need to restore. Here's our part, though. We can take it kicking and screaming and choose to not enjoy it, or we can actually just be obedient in it. 
Does anyone else have a day off? And then on your day off, as you're sitting there, James is very, let me prefix this by saying, James is very good sometimes at, well, I think sometimes we're good with each other, at reminding each other when we've had too much and we need to rest. And then like sometimes we're a little like stubborn with each other saying, fine, we'll do nothing today. But then really what you're doing is you're sitting there thinking about all the things that you should be doing. You're worried and you're anxious about all the things that could be getting done at that moment. Guys, my house is a disaster all the time right now. You can ask my parents, they live in my basement. Um, you know, and so to take time is like, is like a difficult thing because I'm like, well, you know, if someone shows up, they're gonna see that there's a lot of dog hair on my floor right now, and I'm not sure like I want them, to, and I never really had a super high standard of clean, just so you know, but like, you know, I recognize that it's dirtier than maybe it was even like, you know, a couple years ago. And so to take rest when I know that things need to be done, like my laundry or my house or fill in the blank, sometimes there's always any, any given moment 30 emails that I haven't read. And so to take rest becomes difficult, and sometimes God's like, I'm forcing you to take rest, but then you know what? The, the, the dumbest thing that this sheep sometimes could do, and I feel like there's other people in the room that may be the same, that's why I'm telling you, is that you sit there as God's forcing you to take rest or telling you to take rest, or someone in your life has told you to take rest, and you sit there and you worry about all the things that you're not doing while you should be resting. Is anyone else with me? And it's actually saying, God's saying, like, saying, I'm going to lead you there. I'm going to force you to do it sometimes. But guess what? Whether or not you enjoy it is kind of up to you. Like, you kind of have to make that choice. I'm going to be a good shepherd, and I'm going to lead you where you need to go. But guess what? What you do in that place is actually up to you. And then we move on. Verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The verse right before, or the two lines right before, says he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what it's saying is it's actually saying that, God, you are going to lead me down a path that will go through the valley of death sometimes. Do you notice that? He's actually saying that in order to create righteousness in you so that people see me, you may actually be led through very difficult seasons in life. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean that God's not in it. And then there's this beautiful phrase in there, and I tried to name my sermon. Let's just be honest. I am awful with the English language. I actually laid in bed last night and told my husband this. I was like, you know what? I sit, because we were here with Regroup all weekend, and I'm listening to these, like, you know, the leaders of our district, and they just have, like, such eloquent ways of saying things. Did I even say that right? Oh, good. Excellent. Um, you know, and I understand all of their words. Like, so my, my vocabulary isn't small in understanding it, but pronouncing it, it's a whole other story. You know, so I have to use really simple words when I speak because I just don't know how to pronounce things, and then I pronounce them wrong, and then I can see James's smirk from the front row often when I say it wrong, so I know I've said it wrong, but I don't actually know how to correct myself, so I just keep on going. <laughs> Anyways, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, okay, so I was, I, was, I, was, I was titling my sermon this morning, and I put, like, even though I will face, and then everyone gave their two cents, and like, that makes no sense, Maria. Like, no one's going to know what you're talking about. Anyways, so you can call my sermon whatever you want this morning. I think Riker came up with something better. But there's this beautiful verse in there that says this, even though I will. We're at these bookends. And when I read this in this book that I was reading, I was like, this is actually transformative, I think, for the church if we got this. Even though you're leading me through the valley of the shadow of death, here's the thing about the valley of the shadow of death when you're in Israel, okay? All of the predators that live in that environment live in the valley. We don't live like that, right? All of our bears and our cougars, we think of them being up in the mountains, and if you're in the valley, you're by the water, you're probably pretty safe. That's not Israel. Israel is actually, especially at nighttime when it's dark, they're all in the valley. They're looking. They're prowling. They're actually trying to devour things. That's where the predators live. 
And it's saying, God, you're leading me through. Sometimes life is leading me through and you're not even the one leading me, but you're with me as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death where all the predators are, where all of this stuff is. Even though I'm going through it, I will. What does it say? It says, I will fear no evil. There's this declaration of victory in this moment of saying, I know I'm going through where there's, I'm surrounded by things that will devour me, but I'm making a choice to live in victory here. Amen? I'm making a choice to understand that your presence, your peace, your comfort is here in this place. There is this um, frustrating thing that I've contemplated for the last few years that I think we do poorly as the the Christian community. We assume a testimony is when we've gone through something and come out the other side. But you know, the greatest testimony that we have of what God's doing is actually how we handle the middle of it. It's actually what we choose to do when we're in the valley of death. The choices we make there is actually what declares God's goodness, amen? It's really easy for us to declare what God has done and for people to be like, yeah, that's a really cool story. I'm glad God did that in your life. But it's really hard for them to relate to. It's really easy to do that when, you know, we went from here and then I went through this turmoil and this awfulness and now this is what God did and hallelujah. And we would all say, right? Because it's true, there is tremendous, like, of of sharing testimony of the whole picture and the miracles that God has brought. But you know, for someone who doesn't know Jesus or someone who's struggling, you know what transforms their lives is knowing that you proclaim his goodness in the middle of the testimony. That when things are at their worst to what it looks like to everyone else, that's the place that your eyes say, my eyes are fixed on you and that's why I have no fear, Lord. Because I know that no matter what victory looks like in your realm, I know there'll be victory at the end. Could you imagine if as believers we had that kind of faith that actually said, even though things don't look great right now, even though I'm actually going through the valley of the shadow of death, I have nothing to fear, I have nothing to worry about because I know who my God is. That's where our testimony lies, is in that place. It's in this place where I think we understand and our faith gets bolstered. It's in that place where God actually creates righteousness in us. It's in those places we create the depth of faith that we need. Let's continue on. It goes into verse 5. Is that where I am? I think that's where I am. Oh, no. I'm just going to jump to the second half of verse 4. It says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I wrestled with that. I'm like, okay, God, so you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and everything around me is trying to devour me, and then you're talking about the rod and the staff, which is actually used for correction, right, and direction. And like, somehow that gives me comfort. I don't know about you, but does anyone else feel comforted when they're having to be corrected? Like, maybe it's just me, but I don't really like it. You know, James and I have a pretty, like, open, honest relationship, and it's good. But it means that we have this, you know, because, because we, like, we do everything mostly together. Uh, there's a little bit apart now, but most of our lives we've been in, like, work together, home together, like, everything is together. And so we've had to find a rhythm to be able to just tell each other when we think each other are wrong and be able to hash that out. And so, but I don't know about you, but still, even though I want him to be able to do that to me and he would tell you this, he'll tell me if he thinks that I'm wrong and I will sit there poutedly for a few minutes, internally thinking like, I hate you right now. Why would you say that to me? But then the other part of my brain is like, I know you're right and I need to deal with that. And so I don't say any of that. I just sit there kind of like with that pout on my face. It's true, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Amen. It's okay, he does the same thing. Um, <laughs> often he'll disappear for five minutes and then he'll come back and it'll be good. But there's this, this need, right, to be able to do that. But it actually is good. Why? Because at the end of the day, it makes me into more of who I want to be. 
See, correction is a good thing because it actually creates us into people that we actually, deep down, would rather be, you know? I don't know about you, but does anyone want to be a little more graceful? Really, just me? Is that it? No one else wants to be more graceful? Does anyone want to, want to be a little more loving? You know? A little more forgiving? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your encouragement. Um, I'm like, maybe I'm the only one that sucks as a human being. That's okay. Guess what? You get to hear me this morning. Um, Right? We want these things. We just don't like the process sometimes. And it's this process of saying, even though, God, even though you're walking me through things that are really difficult and I don't want to do it, I'm going to take the correction of your staff and your rod, and I'm actually going to take it as comfort as a father who loves me enough to want more for me. Parents who love their kids bring correction. Verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He ends with this idea that, you know what, God, your goodness and your mercy are present with me at any moment. This is a man who didn't have goodness and mercy in certain moments, but he noticed that God's goodness and mercy was there even when he didn't have it. And then he says, and I know I'm going to dwell with you forever, so whatever this world throws at me, my eternity is set. Amen? The whether or not, you know, to the day I die, it feels like I'm just going through trial after trial after trial after trial after trial, pain after pain after pain after pain after pain. Guess what? I get to spend eternity with you. So it really doesn't matter. We can't comprehend that in our linear idea of time, but that is the reality. I feel like when God, we get to be with God one day, we're really going to understand all of these things that we thought were so big and so painful and so hard, and they are because we're in this moment of this finite world, but we're going to realize that guess what? They weren't really that big of a deal. I also think that that day when we get to see God's face and see his glory and see how amazing he truly is, we also would handle all those situations differently here because we would have a very different posture, wouldn't we? Our posture would not be one of defeat. Our posture would be one of faith. Verse 5 says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He kind of goes on to this piece of, you know, even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm surrounded by all of the predators, I am going to fear no evil. And then he says this, he says, eat, you prepare a table for me. We all want a table with the Lord. Anyone want to have dinner with the Lord? You know, he prepares this table for us with his peace and his comfort, with his presence that brings refreshing. He prepares this table for us that we get to sit at, get to be in his presence and all of the things that come along with his spirit's presence. But do you catch where he places it? He places it in the presence of your enemies. See, whether or not you actually sit down and experience all those things at that table is up to you because the problems are probably not going anywhere. Why? Because we live in a fallen world with a whole lot of mess, right? No amens for that? It's just nature. Like, we live in this place that has mess. And so if we're waiting for the mess to go away in order to sit with the Lord and actually experience his presence, guess what? You're never going to experience his presence. Well, maybe. Maybe when you're three. And you grew up in a Christian home, you might. Because things are pretty easy when you're three. I mean, you don't feel like it, but they are. But the rest of your life is probably going to be about a bit of challenge. And we have this choice. You know what I love as I was reading through the Easter story, and I kind of touched on it when I preached the Good Friday service, is that Jesus, in the last meal that he got to have, 
with the people he loved the most, he let his enemies sit at the table. Anyone notice that? Judas got to sit at Jesus' table as he shared the last most intimate moments, the most intimate things that he had to say to the people that he loved the most. He actually allowed Judas to sit there and be with them. I think that this is what this verse is actually talking about. He's saying, you know what, God? God says, I'm gonna prepare a table for you and whether or not you enjoy it is up to you because guess what? I'm still asking you to love your enemies. I'm not taking them away. The people that are, you're struggling with, the situations that you're not comfortable with, it depends on who you have your eyes on. See, if we have our eyes on the problem, if we have our eyes on the struggle, we're always going to miss the table. We're always going to miss the food that's in front of us, the abundance that's in front of us. We're going to miss it. You're going to miss what God wants to do in your life 100% of the time if you have your eyes fixed on the problem and not fixed on Jesus. Amen? I'm going to call the worship team up. I'm going to finish with this, a really quick understanding of the oil. I think there's this beauty in the oil there that he's talking about. He's saying, I... Uh, your anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. As you sit there at the table in the presence of your enemies, but with the Lord, he has this picture of oil, and oil is for three things. One, for sheep, which he's talking about, we are sheep. It's actually for protection. They would dump oil over sheep's heads uh, because there was these gnats and these little bugs that would actually come and, and lay eggs in their eyes and in their nostrils, and then they would hatch, right? Disgusting, I know. So what would they do to protect them? They would pour oil over them to protect them. In the midst of all the things that want to destroy them, they'd pour oil over them. And God's saying, as you sit in the table, I'm pouring oil over you to protect you. The second thing oil does is oil was used for the weary traveler. They actually, because, you know, showering was not as easy as it is today, a weary traveler would come, and when they're, they're worn out and they're tired and they're weary, they would actually pour oil on them, oil with fragrances that would bring refreshing and comfort. It would, be, it would be an oil that would say, you're here to settle in and to rest. The third thing the oil would do is it was anointing for purpose, right? Right? for kingship or priesthood. They would anoint them, they would pour oil over them, and it was this, this, this picture of, of call and purpose in someone's life. We're ending here that, that God wants to redeem your testimony in the middle of whatever season of life you're in. He wants to give you protection, he wants to give you rest, and he wants to give you purpose. He wants to use it, but the choice is whether or not you are going to let him redeem it. We're going to sing one song, and I'm going to pray over you. I just encourage you, whatever your life has thrown at you, we all have things, whether or not it's physical things, whether or not it's family things, whether or not it's relational things, whether or not it's jobs, struggles, we all have these things. And I pray that this morning, before you leave, you would actually take a minute and say, God, I am sorry. Would you put a resilience in me that says, even though I will. God, I just pray over your church this morning. God, I just pray that your presence would be rich here. God, that you would cause us as we face whatever valley either you're bringing us through or life has brought us through, God, but that we would keep our eyes fixed on you that we would keep our eyes fixed on the one that brings victory. God, I pray that we would proclaim your goodness in the middle. God, that we would sit down at that table and not be worried about who's around us or who else is at the table, but that we would look at you. God, that we would eat the food that you've, prevent, or that you've put before us to bring us res restoration. God, we repent before you this morning for the times that we've taken our eyes off of you and we've let our own vengeance, we've let our own pain, we've let our own circumstance drive where our eyes are being looked at or where our eyes are looking at.
God, we repent. We come before you. We say, God, would you help us to see your goodness in it? <laughs>